Hey guys, um, as you heard, you probably heard the news, it's been all over, that uh, I just uh, got a $50 million judgment against me. So the court is saying that I owe St. Luke's $50 million for uh, speaking out against them over the baby Cyrus thing. And uh, I'm often asked why I did not hire a team of attorneys and defend myself in the court. And so I wanted to offer you four reasons why I have not defended myself against St. Luke's in the Ada County Court. And reason number one is historically courts are used by the rich and the powerful to hurt innocent people. Uh, for example, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks is a good example. And you may not know, probably never considered what happened to Rosa Parks, but she was convicted by a jury of her peers of disorderly conduct for sitting at the front of the bus as a black woman. Of course, you heard the sitting at the front of the bus and all of that and her stand, but did you know that she was convicted by a jury in a court? And not only that, she appealed her conviction and apparently for... She appealed for a bench trial in the circuit court where she was convicted again. And then the following February, after she was convicted the second time, the Alabama State Court ruled not to overturn her conviction. And it included in their, you know, in their findings that nothing before the court for, is for review. They basically said there's nothing before the court for review. The court deemed also that her conviction was statutory and quasi-criminal in nature, and they refused to overturn her convictions. Now, the interesting thing is, is at the same time, right around the same time as this is going on, the federal court ruled uh, that bus segregation was unconstitutional. They ruled in Browder versus Gale. But the Alabama court continued to rule that her actions of sitting in front of the bus were criminal in nature. And they upheld the, the conviction. And to this day, her criminal record shows that she was found guilty by a jury in a court of law for sitting in front of the bus as a black woman. So this is my question to you. Was Rosa Parks' trial and conviction in court of law with a jury justice? I think you know the answer. Another good example, and I've got a few of these if you'll stick with me is that uh, an example of 16-year-old Hemleth Hubener, uh, who listened to his brother's forbidden shortwave radio. Uh, it was the voice of the BBC announcer painting a picture of Nazi Germany that was dra drastically different from the one he had been told to believe. Obviously, he lived in Germany. Uh, as he listened to the forbidden radio broadcast, he decided to tell his fellow Germans Germans, uh, the truth about Nazi Germany, and he produced a series of articles that, in, that included his own political commentary and transcriptions of the radio show uh, and what it was saying. And then with help of other teenagers, he distributed these articles throughout Hamburg. And within months, he would be dead. He was the youngest ever convicted in the German People's Court. And a judge found him guilty of conspiracy of committing high treason and ordered his ex execution. The judge also convicted his three friends uh, for listening to a foreign radio station and distributing foreign radio news. Uh, Hubner was executed at age 17 and his friends were sentenced to hard labor and remained in prison camps until the end of World War II. Now, question. Was Hubner and his friends criminals for listening to radio and publishing articles about what they heard? After all, due process was given them and a jury found them guilty. So one more, one more example. The uh, infamous English in Inquisitions. Uh, this happened during the 16th century. Uh, hundreds of Protestants in England were executed under the law. And what were they convicted of? Or heresy. They believed differently than those in control of the state. Uh, some details of hundreds of people who were executed under the law 
are recorded in Fox's Books of Martyrs. For example, Thomas Harding had his brains dashed out by officers and then was burned to death. Uh, I don't know what killed him first, but uh, he was, you know, his brains were dashed out and then he was burned probably at the stake. And his crime was reading the Bible and praying in English, which was forbidden. And hundreds, again, hundreds, this, and when you look at this Fox's Book of Martyrs, you can see there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that were burned or drowned or quartered um, or their heads were cut off. Just hundreds. I'm looking at the list right now. It's just amazing. And then there was a, a whole bunch of them that were put in prison and died in prison. And all the, although these executions were not all the, at the same time, and they, weren't, they were done in many different ways, every person on this list has one thing in common. They were given a trial in a government court and convicted by a jury before being executed. Now, uh, Judith Richards wrote a book called Mary Tudor. Uh, she points this out. However, however bloody the end, the trials of the Protestant heretics were judicial affairs adhering to strict legal, legal protocol under the Privy Council with Parliament's blessings. So in other words, every person killed for their beliefs during the Inquisition was given a trial in court under the law and were legally executed. Therefore, <laughs> we must consider these questions. Does being condemned in a court of law by a judge or a jury make the conviction and punishment right? Was, was Rosa Park wrong because she was convicted by a jury in a state court? Was 16-year-old Hamlet Hubener, it was his execution justice because he was convicted by a German court? Were hundreds of Puritan believers justly burnt uh, at the stake, uh, drowned or quartered because they were found guilty in official English trials? Uh, we need to ask these questions. Because a judge or a jury rules, does it make them right? Does it make them just? Is truth whatever a judge says or what people in a jury collectively agree upon? Hopefully you can answer these questions. Now, whether it be the show trials of Russia in Russia, the kangaroo courts in Germany, the human rights trials in China, or even Southern justice in the United States, Trials and courts have often been used to justify punishment upon those who threaten the political status quo. And unfortunately, uh, it historically appears that the masses typically accept any verdict uh, or any punishment as justice as long as it is done in a court. Now, this is the part where I kind of I want to warn you, because this is where it gets very real and uncomfortable for most people because anybody who participates in or accepts evil acts because a judge is overseeing it puts the laws of man over the laws of God. And God is the authority of good and bad and every person has an inherent ability within them to know right and wrong and they have a duty to stand against it. Therefore, when someone accepts injustice because it is ordered by a judge or a jury, they are offending their own consciousness that God gave them. And we, we see this idol type worship of the courts everywhere in the United States. It's all over. I mean, I've heard it so many times. Everybody's like, you know, run to the courts, run to the court, get, to, get attorneys, go through all this thing. You know, put your faith in the courts. Now, you know, this, again, this idol type worshiping of the courts is everywhere. And no matter how obvious the corruption is, no matter how blatantly unjust the court's rulings are, people accept and obey them anyway, as if God changed the laws of nature and ruled in just himself. Now, after being uh, forced to participate in the 80 county courts on several occasions, I <laughs> know for certain of their wickedness and unjust practices designed to destroy their political enemies like me. 
I, I have experienced it, and I understand it. I've seen it. Uh, and another prime example of this is when they convicted Robert Jones of disturbing the peace when he was peacefully protesting mass requirements in school. He was on a public sidewalk, and they sentenced him to six months in jail. The Ada County Court is a slew of raging homosexual leftists that hate me and anything I stand for or anyone that stands with me. They hate the conservative independence that Idaho represents and are seeking to change it through their court rulings. So why would I subject myself to them? Why? Now, reason number two. There is no part of taking baby Cyrus from his parents that was just or right in any way. None. And I refuse to legit legitimize the court proceedings in this case by participating in it. There's an old adage that says, there is only room for argument if there's doubt. And I have no doubt that standing for baby Cyrus and his parents was right. Therefore, I will not marginalize my stand by arguing about it in a wicked political court. Reason number three. From the beginning of this litigation, I considered the enormous burden that fighting this case would put on my family, on my time, and on my finances. And after all, I could literally feel... Um, a dumpster, a commercial dumpster full of the legal paperwork. In fact, I'm going to show you right here. I've got a stack of papers that is only one week. It came in three days, one week. And you tell me if, if it even makes sense. This is what I get. This is what I've got. I can fill dumpsters full full of those papers. I could fill a commercial dumpster full of those. That is one week's worth. And therefore, I deliberately decided not to appear, requiring Judge Norton to default me under the Idaho Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 55A1. And I want to read that to you. It says, this is Rule 55A1 of the Idaho Rules of Civil Procedure. It says, when a party against whom a judgment for affirmation relief is sought has failed to plead or otherwise defend, and that failure is shown by affidavit or otherwise, the court must order entry of the party's default. Now, at the start of this case, St. Luke's executives were only suing for $300,000. And Chris Roth, the St. Luke's CEO, said they were going to give it to charity. All of it was going to go to charity. They were all trying to make the media, make a big thing. We're just going to $300,000 and, and it's all going to go to charity, they said. Now, and only 50,000 of it would be required from me personally. So therefore, rather than hiring a, a team of expensive attorneys and spending years in the courtroom, I concluded, I believe wisely, that defaulting would be the least time-consuming and the least expensive way to mitigate this, this lawsuit. However, Judge Lynn Norton intentionally did not default me as required by law. I just read you the law. She must do it if I don't respond and I do not participate. She must default me and end the case. But she didn't. Instead, she kept the case going for over a year never defaulting me, allowing St. Luke's attorneys to amend the complaint four times, increasing the punitive damages now to over $52 million. And then she racked up, then they racked up a $700,000 legal bill. And then on top of it, she issued a civil warrant for my arrest. And to further the court's corruption, shortly before Judge, Judge Norton recused herself, just days after she entered the default, I appeared for the first time in the case, motioning the court to set aside the default. But what happened? Judge Norton ignored my motion and moved forward with the determining damages anyway. And this action is another major violation of the rules of civil procedure committed by the Ada County Court. Now, 
I'm not surprised by all this because because of the nature of the Ada County Courts and their extreme bias towards me. And I believe that because of this, because of their extreme bias towards me, whether I hired a team of attorneys or not, I am certain the outcome would have been the same. The only difference would be the hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney fees I would owe right now. Uh, my own attorneys. And it, it, and the years and the family time I would have lost and the justification I would be given the courts by participating. Now, reason number four and the final reason. I don't, I don't believe that rights are maintained in the courts. And I've been in the courts a lot. There was a time where the trial attorneys in, in Nevada were saying that my brother and I had more time in trial than all those attorneys that we had. And so I spent many, many, many hours and weeks in the courts. And I, ha I have come to a firm conclusion that individual rights are not maintained in the courts. In fact, as I pointed out earlier, rights are often diminished in the courts. And the Bible is a good example. It's full of examples of men using the courts to punish and destroy the righteous. Uh, rights are preserved only by claiming them, using them, and defending them. And securing liberty is an individual and collective effort that has nothing to do with judges and juries. It has nothing to do with votes or elections, by the way, either. So for many of you out there, I apologize for bursting your political bubble of hope that the next election is going to, you know, bring you some freedom, bring freedom. There is absolutely no evidence historically where liberty was won or preserved in a courtroom or a ballot box. None. Um, rights, the, rights can be confirmed there in the court. They can be confirmed in the court, but obtaining and preserving freedom is a physical task that is required by those who want to be and remain free. It requires physical defensive action to remain free. I want to say that again. It requires physical defensive action to remain free. And we as a people have been duped into worshiping the courts, offering up our rights that were given to us by God to judges and lawyers. We have been led to believe that we must obey the orders of a judge over anything else, including God's word. Look, look at our police officers and our sheriffs. They will do anything they are told to do by a judge, even if they know it is unconstitutional, even if they know it is corrupt, even if they know it is morally wrong. This is cult-like worshiping. That's what it is. It's cult-like worshiping. Now, just to wrap up here, and, I, and I, I'm thankful that you would listen to me and uh, consider what I'm saying. And I just want to say that I know that God gave me the ability to work and to provide a home and a living for my family. And I know he gave me that duty and responsibility. And I have honestly done that throughout my life, and I have obtained a little bit extra. And this is a great gift to me from God. It's a great blessing to my family and I. And I owe St. Luke's nothing. I have never used their services or even gone into one of their facilities. I owe them nothing. And I will not enter into a courtroom and beg a judge to allow me to keep the possessions that God has given me. I refuse. And so these are a few of the reasons I have not defended myself against St. Luke's in the Ada County Court. And I just want to thank you for your time and, and thank you for your consideration.